Holy crap, we're actually starting on time. What's going on, people? We're back for the next installment of our summer series. I am once again joined by Luke the Man, a.k.a. Luke of Luke Reviews, in order to go over the upcoming... Uh, actually, no, sorry, not the upcoming. It already came out. The 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 fifth installment in the Indiana Jones series. Uh, is this long-awaited? I can't say for sure. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the first Indiana Jones movie not directed by Steven Spielberg, this time directed by James Mangold, who has kind of replaced John Favreau as Disney's go-to uh, studio shell, I mean, uh, studio director. Luke, you got anything to say before we get this going? Uh, not much for this final third outing, as right. I like to call it. <laughs> I couldn't think of a better way to describe it. All of that and more on today's episode of the Talking TV Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Happy Saturday morning. We are recording this on a Saturday because I am leaving for another vacation, actually, in a couple of hours. But it was never going to stop me from podcasting. We are here to talk about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the next installment in our summer series. Luke, June is officially over, which you know what that means. It's July month, which means this is our month, baby. We got Mission Impossible. We got Nolan. And, of course, the most anticipated movie, arguably, of the year, Greta Gerwig's Barbie. But first, we had to get through this movie, which... I don't want to say that this was a chore to get through, but needless to say that this is, I believe, the first feature-length film from Lucasfilm that we're getting on the big screen since 2019's The Rise of Skywalker. And just given the overall, uh, let, 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 let's call it bad taste in our mouth, that a, a decent amount of those Star Wars films that came out, uh, sorry, sorry a, a bad taste in our mouth that those uh, Disney Star Wars films left in our mouth, I can't exactly say that anticipation for this was high. But... There's the whole other facet of this going into this, which is that Indiana Jones has always been a distinctly different feeling franchise from Star Wars, even though it's kind of came from the same creators, you know, as opposed to Star Wars, which was always entirely Lucas's vision. Indiana Jones has always been this kind of great collaboration between Lucas and Spielberg, you know, kind of tackling a lot of the pulp adventure stories from when they were younger and kind of adapting them with like more of a big budget feel. You know, that's how, you know, Lucas is always writing the scripts. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Spielberg is all obviously always directing those first three films. I know pe some people have a couple problems with Temple of Doom, but for the most part, those first three films are pretty seamless. I would argue that that uh, that those first three films are a pretty seamless trilogy, arguably one of my personal favorite ones. Then you get Kingdom of the Crystal Skull in 2008, and people weren't so hot on this one, but I had a strange feeling. It's funny. I was talking with my brothers about this upcoming movie. And just given the overall trajectory of like kind of what blockbuster filmmaking has become in the age of Disney – and, and my brothers and I had a theory, which is they're, they're like, this is kind of going to do what the sequel Star Wars movies did for the prequels, which is that th this movie is going to be so, like, bland and corporatized compared to that it's going to make Kingdom of the Crystal Skull look better. Now, after having seen this movie, I can't necessarily agree with that 100%, but I still think that the sentiment stands. So, so what, what do you think of that, first and foremost? Well, I've always been a Kingdom of the Crystal Skull enjoyer. It was, I, I it was, it was one of, it was that one. It, it's my dad's favorite for whatever reason. So I was the one that I all, I was the one I always saw growing up. Uh, but after that, I realized, oh, the first three actually, yeah, a, a fair amount better. But I still do have a, a lot, a lot of love for the, for the fourth one. And yeah, I definitely see your point that that now people are thinking, oh, maybe that one wasn't so yeah. bad. You know? Yeah, yeah. You, well, you see the more Spielberg touch come through in that yes. one compared to this one i think that's that's one of my biggest problems with this movie and we'll get into that but uh but yeah it, it's doing that the uh, sequel thing it, it really is it really is well it's just that like there, there's really something about the 2000s i feel like that's why people in general not just guys our age who grew up during that time period are becoming so nostalgic for that time period is because that time period really was magic in terms of finally having like all the money in the world that they could throw at these franchises. You know, again, look at all of the gigantic franchises that we got out of that decade. You know, your Harry Potters, your Lord of the Rings, your Pirates of the Caribbean, your Transformers, all the incredible animated movies that we got. And, uh, you know, a, a lot, and obviously this, the big ones being the Star Wars prequels. And even the ones that weren't as well reviewed, people are kind of still coming back to that because even if 
the stories themselves aren't that well done and well told. There is just an, a, a, a pure creativity and ingenuity that is still put into those movies that you just don't get with a lot of big budget blockbusters now. It's just for sheer fact of what the business has become. They're very corporatized. They're very over. They're very. They have a million different uh, people that they have to get through before they finally get to the big screen. They have to satisfy four quadrants. They have to be, you know, very very safe, not take any risks. And well, I'm not going to say that they, that these were as blatantly offensive as the Star Wars sequels in terms of how they're definitely trying to kind of move the old characters out of the way in terms of the new character in order to make room for the new characters. This one's a bit strange because it feels like that's exactly what they were trying to do at the beginning. And then like about halfway through, it, it, it's because like, this because if memory serves, this movie's been in production for quite a while. I don't remember when they started filming exactly, but I want to say it was like around late 2021, early 2022, which is when Bob Chapek was still in charge of Disney. And it felt like, again, like it was going to do what the Star Wars sequels were doing, where they were trying to get the old characters out of the way so they can move it onto the new characters. And then about halfway through, it felt like when, when it transitioned back from the one CEO to the old Bob, they were just like, nope. And, and, and it results in one of the most confused, like it, like weird endings ever where you have a movie here that is so blatantly trying to be to, to the most Indiana Jones as humanly possible. It, it's so fascinating because like I, I love – I, I think I that you, you called this early on like when we were talking about Shang-Chi, which is where I don't think I've ever sat through a more obvious instance of a movie that felt like it was written by artificial intelligence than I have with this one because this such – this so felt like a movie that was like, okay, we got to hit all these beats for Indiana Jones. We got to have – it's like we got to have the hidden treasure that's been locked away for, a de for years. We have to have – the new uh, female sidekick. We have to have the plucky, precocious kid sidekick. We got to have Nazis back because oh, Indiana Jones movie, because of every time that we haven't had Nazis as the bad guys, people haven't liked it. You know, uh, going back to Temple of Doom and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Uh, we got to have, uh, what's it called? We got to have some crazy, wacky, like, like use of magic in, in the third act in, in order to satisfy it. And then at the end, we're, we're, we're going to have Indy, you know, reunite with his love interest, only it's not going to be who you think it is because let, let's face it, Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge get together was never going to happen. Even though there are several instances in this movie where it feels like they're trying to hit at it, which is just weird to say the least. But like, I, I don't know. Like, like it definitely felt li like Kingdom of the, like, like, the, the biggest difference for me between this and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull feels like a sloppy Indiana Jones movie, but it still feels like an Indiana Jones movie. Like, it's still got to me all of, like, the beats. You know, it's got, like, the slapstick. It's got the crazy set pieces, right? It just goes a little bit over the top of the CG. And this one, it feels like, oh, it, it, it feels like, okay, we have all the Indiana Jones beats, but it it, it feels safe. And especially with, 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 the, with the deep fake, uh, uh, what's it called? With the, with the deep fake, the, the de-aged, Harrison Ford at the beginning on the stunt double feels so almost as artificial and hollow as as one of those Disney live action remakes. Like I don't know, like like when when you have that opening sequence, which is long, by the way. Oh my god, I think this is the longest Indiana Jones movie yet. It's two and a half hours, and my god, do I feel the length of it? Especially that opening sequence when you have um like, like Indiana's latest sidekick played by Toby Jones who. Might be the worst one of them. At the very least, they made Ray Winstone like a like a Soviet spy in the last one, so it made it seem like he was. So, that, so there was a reason as to why he was like kind of clumsy and incompetent. But this one, it's like no, Toby Jones just kind of sucks. And you're like, why is is Indiana Jones making way? At the very least, in the past, all of Indiana Jones sidekicks have been, uh, you know, like competent and awesome. But you have this like like I don't know like like I don't know. You you give me your thoughts on this because I feel like I've been ranting for a little bit here. Where, where do I even start? Uh, let, exactly. Let's just, let's, exactly. Let's, let's just pick up where you left off with the opening. I, I'll be honest. I enjoyed the opening because it was just nice seeing a, a younger Indiana Jones on the big screen. Because I've never seen an Indiana Jones movie on the big screen. It was it was just cool. But when you take off that mask and he, he looks 40, but then he sounds 80. It's like, yes. whoa. Uh, yes. Okay. At the very least, they had the intelligence and foresight to use a stunt double so that it wasn't like 80-year-old, like like the Irishman, where it's like 80-year-old Robert De Niro trying to be, uh, you know, 20 years old, and he tries to beat up a guy outside a store, and it's one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen. Yeah, to be to be fair, I, I did I, I enjoyed the opening. I I don't really have too many gripes with that. I had I had a fair amount of hope for the rest of the movie after that. Uh, fortunately, that that did that opening did not <laughs> that, that, that got dashed. The it did not follow through all the way. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, it doesn't have, it just doesn't have any sense of urgency 
or realness to the whole thing. Like all the other ones, there's just like sort of impending doom or or something. Like the bad guys are going to get the thing, and they're good, and get a, trying to get the thing in this one as well. But this is like you said, it feels so fake, so artificial, uh, soulless. Even I dare say, and I I, th- I want to bring this up because I saw it on, on Twitter, and I think it's a it's a great point. And it comes in terms of budget, so. Just to give you a few numbers, Fast X cost $340 million. The Flash cost $200 million. This is $300 million compared to a trailer that came out of two days ago, Dune Part 2, $122 million. I think having a less budget forces them to, to try more. Like back the first Indiana Jones, the very first one, they were like trying to get more and more budget. Like they were... It was made on like I don't know twenty million or something, something or like even that. or even less. Like, and that's like one of the greatest movies of all time. So less budget makes better movies. It doesn't automatically mean oh more budget. We can do whatever you want. You know, if you're not it, it nowadays, it's a sign that the movie just ballooned out of uh, scheduling or whatever. And yeah, ultimately, it shows that there's a lot of over reliance on CG. And I guess that the fact that Harrison Ford is eighty maybe. It's just you're just not meant to make an Indiana Jones movie at that point. Yeah, there's a couple of different factors that we have to address when it comes to like the, the the reasons for why this movie works. Number one, first and foremost, Harrison Ford. Like I, I I really can't figure him out because it feels like every single time he's doing an interview, and I know that part of it is trolling, right? And part of it is like he's just been doing this so long. Every, it feels like every single time. We see him in an interview. He's almost always like got such. He's become such the grumpy old man, where he's like, "What the fuck am I doing here? Why am I getting asked all these questions?" It feels like that's what what, what we're getting every single time he's being interviewed. Yet he's still doing these movies. And I get it. He likes the paycheck, but like he's already done like two Star Wars sequels, a Blade Runner sequel, and now he's back for Indiana Jones, the the third one. It's like. At what point is enough? You know, he, he like, like he's clearly still a good actor. We just saw him on Apple TV Plus as shrinking. You know, I, I I usually never make this statement because for me, I I always can kind of understand a reason as to why actors come back. But now he's going to be the new Thunderbolt Ross in in in, in the, the next two Marvel movies with with Captain America: Brave New World, as it was retitled, and the Thunderbolts. And first off, just the thought of imagining Harrison Ford's voice coming out of the Red Hulk is hysterical. But Secondly, I'm like, at what point is it like, is it enough enough? You know, I get it. Disney is definitely like still delivering the biggest paychecks, but like, like I just don't get it. You know, and especially when people are talking like, oh, Harrison Ford's 80. You're right. And unlike Sylvester Stallone, who is still in relatively good shape, it can still like pull off the massive amounts of stunts that were that are required for the for those movies like Expendables and like um and and uh and, and Tulsa King and stuff that he's doing. And even Stallone is like starting to realize his age, you know? Like Harrison Ford, man, like he even there's even a moment, a line in this movie where he's like climbing up a series of rocks with Phoebe Waller Bridge and he's just listing off the different things like, oh, you haven't been, you know, almost killed by voodoo or had your heart ripped out or or not to mention shot nine times, a plate in your side, uh, uh, uh you know, and, 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 and metal in your knee. And, and like, obviously, yeah, that's funny as an Indiana Jones thing. But at the same time, I'm like, dude, I get it. Harrison Ford, you're old. You don't want to be doing this anymore. You don't have to. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, again, the blatant and not this isn't even just Lucasfilm this is just Disney in general and I'm really really starting to get annoyed by it it's been I've been tolerating it up until this point but it really is starting to frustrate me the idea of of them trying to use old IP in order to introduce new characters in order to attempt to replace the old ones that are never as interesting never as compelling partially because the characters they introduce just aren't that interesting um second third the other part of it being that the writers that they have writing this stuff are just not that interesting um yeah, i mentioned that when, it, when when the credits rolled i was waiting to see how many people wrote this movie it was like boom 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 it was like you have jazz and john henry butterworth who have written the last couple of james mangold movies they also wrote four v ferrari which i know you're a big fan of that movie i unfortunately am not they had a credited rewrite by phoebe waller bridge and it was so funny because i was trying to watch the movie like similar to similar to solo the other excellent uh disney installment that she was in just to try and pinpoint which parts of the movie she wrote and i got almost like identify beat for beat which ones and i had to imagine that i'm right like the scene where she's like li- li- like going over the tablet and like um uh, and like reading off the 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 archimedes code or whatever in order to translate it and, and where she's like going around like making fun of all of, of mads mickelson and the rest of the nazis for how dumb they are 
and, and like and, and like complimenting them. I'm like, yeah, Waller Bridge just pretty much wrote that scene, but it's Phoebe Waller Bridge, which means that yeah, she probably like wrote that on like a napkin like the night before at a bar or something, and then came in the next day. It's like we're doing this, you know. Also, you had her uncredited rewrites on on or sorry, her credited rewrites on No Time to Die, which were probably a little bit more subtle, but still. And then. So you so you've got that, right? You've got the Phoebe Waller Bridge and you've got like her version of Short Round, which I was just watching that kid in the movie, and I felt bad because at this point, these kids have to know what they're getting into with Disney, and that it's just it's not gonna give them any justice or any dessert. And I'm just sitting there like this kid wishes he was short round, you know? Like this kid wishes. I'm like, let, I'm like, let me guess. I'm like, they don't even bother to say that this kid is an orphan, it's just alluded at. They probably can't say it because they're like, oh no, it might like piss off some people. And then it's and he like, has like oh, the same exact origin as right, short round. Right, like, exactly. But but he's way less interesting. Also, I don't think that kid gets a single scratch on him the entire movie. You know, what is what is it that you were saying a couple weeks ago about characters uh, like, you in know, uh, in Transformers? No one sweats. Exactly. Like, exactly. And no one this, no one's dirty. No one's right, no one's dirty. This kid is in the desert at sea in underground caves. I I I I, well, I swear what what he what he what he dragged the big Nazi into the water and then handcuffed him to the underground. Okay, which I'm like, okay, wow, that this guy. All I was thinking was, I'm like, Jesus Christ, this kid's a fucking sociopath. I mean, I get it, it's a Nazi bad guy, but still, you know. And like, like I don't think I ever saw Short Round like killing someone like that. And then, and then, like, he gets out of the water, and I'm like, how fast did he dry off as he's like climbing up onto the statue in order to jump on Hoy Boyd Holbrook's character? So, that, so that that's the other issue, the new characters. Thirdly. I'm tired of them wasting great actors as these villains. I really am. You know, like, like Kate Blanchett in the last one, she was fun. She was comically over the top, you know, and, and like she, she understood the assignment. I didn't think she was that bad. And, the, but so you have Mads Mikkelsen in this one and Mads Mikkelsen definitely in the last couple of Disney movies he's been in has been a varying quality. He was another generic Marvel movie, Marvel villain in Dr. Strange. I thought he actually had a, he was a uh, pretty empathetic and, and, and pretty really good part in Rogue One. And here he's just, he's good. He's adding a lot of character. I think his character motivation is interesting, if not for the fact that we've seen it before. We've seen other movies of other people who are saying, oh, Hitler's vision was good, but it was flawed. I could do better than them. We've seen that before. And so that, I'm just like, okay. And then you just have generic henchmen. And it really sucks because I like Boyd Holbrook. I really do. He, he was really making a name for himself in the late 2010s. And now the fact that he's just getting cast as like generic villain number one and two it's, it's like, okay, you know? And and in terms of, like, the giant third act twist where the whole crux of this movie is that the, the latest MacGuffin that they're after is this thing called the Dial of Destiny, uh, which was supposedly invented by Archimedes, which is this dial that will allow people to travel through time. And Mads Mikkelsen is, is going to use it to travel back in time in order to supplant and replace Hitler. Like, I'm not going to get mad at that because, again, these movies have a history of having devices that are capable of ridiculous crazy supernatural power you know i always thought it was kind of dumb where people got mad at the at the crystal skull and that leading to actual aliens but they were perfectly calm and chill with, with the ark of the covenant melting and destroying an entire exactly like, piece of, like group of nazis I, I never understood that criticism i've always been like oh yeah aliens like i yeah. believe i believe in cool. aliens more than i do god like, right exactly that's just, that's just how I, I am I, right i never understood why people were pissed off at that movie i'm i'm chalking that up to the the, the sci-fi and religion crossover you know it's like where people don't like that crossover and indiana jones has primarily been religion the one facet of this movie that i think at least like did well is that this movie kind of doubled down on it where it was again he's like yeah it's kind of a mix of like math and science you know like where it's incorporating history but i think and i, I want to save the ending bit because i i we need to talk about that just specifically because lordy 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 talk about just uh, uh again at the very least following all the rules of storytelling and then just throwing it all out the window when it comes to that third act where i think the biggest problem that i have with this movie is that I, I, I know a lot of YouTubers and a lot of people have been having problems recently with, with Disney's treatment of older characters and how they keep turning them into sad, pathetic versions of their characters who just want to die. You know, uh, I, I personally don't really buy into that with the Star Wars movies because I still think that Harrison Ford was pretty badass in Force Awakens. You know, even even if his death, everybody saw a mile coming, a mile away. And, and Luke's arc in... The Last Jedi, I actually thought, wasn't the worst. It could have definitely been better, but it wasn't the worst. But here, it's just... I I, I think the... I, I came out of this movie just feeling depressed because I'm like... Harrison Ford is just miserable. It's it's like you're literally just watching Indiana Jones waiting to die. 
And then, like, and then he gets whisked away on this adventure after he gets, like, framed for murder. And then he, like, throughout the movie, he's, like, giving away revelations. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm kind of miserable, you know? Where, where you, like, they, they definitely do, um, what's it called? Um, I, I, I definitely do appreciate that they are still trying to, like, make references to the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And they're not trying to, like, you know, retcon that movie out of existence, which I do enjoy. But at what price? Because we come to find out that Mutt Williams, I don't know if this is Disney doing a dig at Shia LaBeouf, but, like, his son enlisted in Vietnam and died. He's starting off this movie. Marion is divorcing him. He's on his last legs of his, of, of his, uh, of his, archaeo- of his uh, professor's time. Uh, what's it called? He's literally, it's his last day before he retires. He's having, he's having to pull the grumpy old man routine where he's getting mad at, you know, those damn hippies and, the, and their, uh, and, and, and their loud music. And, 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 and it was also one of the most jarring things ever where he gets woken up in his apartment, hung over to magical mystery tour played by the Beatles. It's like, get it? This takes place in the 60s. Also, one of the strangest inserts I've ever seen where you have hippies that are celebrating the moon landing, but also protesting Vietnam. That was an interesting mix right there. And and, and then, uh, through, and then which leads to the end. And it's just, it's sad, you know? It's like, I don't want to watch Indiana Jones just be miserable and waiting to die, you know? And, and, and he's sitting in a bar when Phoebe Waller Bridge comes to see him first. And he's like, oh man, the moon. It's like, uh, it's like, it, it's like the desert, you know? It's like, uh, it's, uh, we shouldn't have gone there and there's no blackjack or whatever, whatever it is that he says. I'm like, okay. Like, uh, I, way, way to really show yourself as being ageist, you know? It's like, you hate hippies. Uh, you know, you're, 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 you're he's probably for Vietnam. Uh, what, what's it called? He, um, he, he, he's against the moon landing and he's just waiting for death. I'm like, yeah, what a, what a, what an uplifting, fun Indiana Jones movie. You know, at the very least in the last one, yeah, he's cracking jokes and it's a little bit of the funny daddy old man, but at the very least he's still Indiana Jones. He still got it, you know, all that. So like, I don't know. What are your thoughts on just the, 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 the sullenness and really just moral depressingness of the character? Not to mention the fact that there are other characters in this movie. It's like, yeah, they, it's like characters that are driven insane. He's like destroyed every relationship with every person that he knows. Phoebe Waller Bridges arc is, is pretty much like, oh, she's a shitty person because she didn't have a father figure because Indy was supposed to raise her after her dad went nuts and he wasn't there for her. Like, I don't know. I just, that's the part, that, that's the part where it's like, yeah, the, 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 the Lucasfilm elements of them are really starting to show their ugly head. Their ugly head. Yeah, I guess in the previous movies, like they're funny movies. Like Indy himself is a very funny guy. There's he's some great lines. Like in yes. Temple of Doom, this clip has been going around Twitter. It's like we are going to die. Like when he's being crushed by the by the Incredible. thing. Incredible uh, stuff. For last Last Crusade is just an absolute comedy with oh, Sean it's, Connery. It's great. It's so uh, great. And, and like you said, even King of the Crystal Skull, he's he's funny in that and. Maybe in this one, by trying to make the people around him, especially uh, Phoebe Waller Bridges' character, make her funnier, that makes him less funnier. Right. So that in turn plays into the depressed old man thing, and especially towards the end, where where he's like, he, I, he, I want to do this, and that's like quite a weird what? turn. Like, where did right. that come from? It's like Indiana uh, Jones was never about giving up. He was always about. Again, even in the face of literal death, he was always about never giving up and never saying, you know, even going back to Raiders where he's telling Marion, he's like, don't look, Marion, keep your eyes shut. You know, it's like they won't, they maybe won't kill us if we're not looking directly into the eyes of God, you know? And he was always about like uh, never giving up, always being the, always having the can do spirit also. And like, you knew this was going to happen, but the fact that like Indiana Jones is a smart guy and he has to be like outwitted by Phoebe Waller-Bridge at every single turn. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, that was just to be expected at this point because that's just literally what every Disney movie has become now. And like I said, it isn't as obvious with certain other movies, but it was really freaking obvious here where, um, what's it called? Where, where where Phoebe Waller Bridge just has to be one up again at every single turn, and ugh, do, do you just want to talk about her now? Like it's because I'm a fan of Fleabag, I am, but I swear every time, every single thing that it seems like she's been involved in ever since she slowly started to inch her way onto the Hollywood poison list, where it's just every time I see her in something, I'm just instantly like, no, I just I don't want to watch it, you know? Where she's the worst part about Solo, and then they kind of kill her off in hilarious fashion in that movie. She's kind of, she's unbearably obnoxious in this. You know, you also have her uncredited rewrites where they have to make her like the, 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 the super impressive, like, like it seems like she's going to replace Indiana Jones. And it sucks because like, 
And yes, it is doing the same thing that they did with Shia LaBeouf in the last one. But at the very least, like Shia LaBeouf seemed like he earned it. Like Shia LaBeouf was like pretty competent in that movie. Like he wasn't trying to be smarter than Indiana Jones, but like he could ride a motorcycle. He could outwit Nazis pretty well. Or, or sorry, the, he, the Russians he was just, pretty well. He was just someone to like to challenge Indy in a way. Exactly. Like just, just like be a bit of a bit of a nuisance even exactly but in like a in like a fun way right but in a fun way not to hear where it's like oh you're an idiot you don't know anything you're mean because you were supposed to raise me and you didn't and it's like okay also wombat is just like oh okay that that's a nickname and yeah i just and not so much like a fan the fact that the, the the most telltale sign is the fact that they are willing to give her her own short round with the exact same origin as short round also the fact that temple this is always the thing that i've always questioned but like the fact that temple of doom is a prequel and i always wondered what happened to short round after the fact but i am wondering if it was because um what's it called if uh, but i also am wondering if that was because um short round just grew up you know and then he eventually left indiana jones you know um but yeah cuz short round was 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 like is like the pinnacle of like 80s kid sidekicks you know it, it, it's it's like i i think short round even surpassed robin at one point and i'm just like yeah like like what what is the point of this and then getting into the into, into the mads mickelson character again i know i know we're repeating things a little bit but mads mickelson there's a certain point in the movie where he's trying to like say like that he has some kinship with indiana jones i think because he's like oh you know none of these nazis respected uh you know this the, the you know these treasures that they were trying to get but you and i we have respect for this stuff you know you just want to see it sit in the museum and i want to use it you know and like i'm just uh, i i think that like switching from the nazis to the russians was actually interesting but like i said there's this weird thing in indiana jones where every time they don't have the nazis be the bad guys the pe people are just not a fan of it you know like it happened with temple of doom it happened with the kingdom of the crystal skull and I like both of those movies more than this movie, but it's like they just felt like they had to bring back the Nazis. But what I was confused by is it's like, okay, so Matt Mickelson was a still living Nazi. And I, and I actually did like the tidbit where it's like, yeah, he worked on the space program and all that, uh, you know, because that's that was what like I thought big... the movie is going to be about like, right. like a while ago that he was going to, it was going to be with the space race or something. But I guess for that, that, that was, that did not. Yeah, that, that was through. just a, that was just a tidbit and a little bit of a li li little bit of a, um, uh, a real life parable there because, you know, every, uh, anybody who studies our history knows that, um, that after World War II, America brought over a bunch of Nazi scientists that claimed to be, you know, uh, uh, only, only supporting Hitler because of, you know, the power structure at the time period. And those uh, Nazi scientists, they, end up con they ended up contributing all their engineering skills to America, which led to a lot of technological advancements that happened in America throughout the 50s and 60s, uh, primarily being the Space race again. There was a very famous Nazi scientist who was a who was a chief scientist on the uh, on the Apollo Eleven mission, and um, and and, and, and so that like I said, they had the thing where he's like, oh, he wants the dial so we can travel back in time and replace Hitler, and of course you have Indiana Jones who is like, no, you know, we got to stop them. You know, Nazis are bad. Bad. It's like, didn't I take you down? And of course you have this very weird thing where they uh, on the train at the beginning. He takes a, a metal pipe to the face, which is a maneuver which should have easily knocked his head clean off, and somehow he and somehow he survived that. I'm like, okay, that was that was my that I think that was the first moment where the movie lost me, aside than like the artificiality of the of the Harrison Ford stand in and the voice, and then. I, I, I think the second moment was when they meet up with Antonio Banderas, but the Nazis like, you know, running with them. And a moment that I, I don't know if this was supposed to be a reference uh, to Raiders when the, when the two boats uh, come alongside each other and friggin' you have uh, Phoebe Waller bridge basically saying, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. You know, as long as you pay me where it's like, okay, like this is, so this character is just despicable where she's like, she will just make a deal literally with the devil in exchange for money where, where I'm like the entirety I'm like, that, that, that's besides the fact that Phoebe Waller Bridge is unbearably obnoxious and just not fun to watch. The fact that her character is just so abhorrent that her character is entirely motivated by financial gain. And like, like where she's like, yeah, she's like screw over like uh, uh Moroccan mobsters and, uh, and, 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 and like, I, I feel like the short round stand in, I don't even remember what the kid's name is, is, is only there to like give her some sort of a contest, but like she straight up just makes a deal with a Nazi. And even though like, yeah, she does help Indiana Jones, like take them down and all that. Like, I still can't help but wonder, it's like, are we supposed to be rooting for this character? Because if you are, you're not doing a good job of selling me on that.
Like, I don't yeah, know, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character in general in this movie? And again, it's it's like a polar opposite to Indy, because he's he's never been about the financial gain. He's always been about, like, the discovery or the, the study of things. Right. Or or even, like, Temple of Doom, where he just returns the stones to the to the village. Uh, yeah, I, I think upon rewatch, I might notice the, the dislike for a character more. Uh, to be fair, I, I think whatever Reject she did on Mont Bond, I think those are only positive. Like, yeah, add a bit, I, add, I agree add a with few, that. Add a few jokes to the to the movie. Um, but this one, yeah, it, it did feel like I don't know. I, I think that certain YouTubers are gonna have an absolute field day with the oh, thumbnails absolutely. on this one. Like, absolutely, oh, Kathleen Kennedy gone woke, go broke. Yeah, and the big, the big X on, the, on we, the thumbnail. We know, we know which YouTubers we're talking about. Yeah, no, it's like. I, I don't know. Like, it just feels like everything that Kathleen Kennedy touches now. It's like ever since the whole Star Wars bubble burst, it's like everything that she touches now just absolutely just turns to shit. And I, I don't know. I heard a rumor saying that, like, Lucas was considering buying back Lucasfilm, which was <laughs> absolutely hilarious. Just given how much money they've lost on these things, because they spent so much freaking money buying Lucasfilm. And the fact that all of the almost with the exception of like one or two movies, almost every single movie has lost them money. And, they, and and this movie also did not have a great opening weekend as well. It's just like like they're not making their money back. Not to mention all the all the money that they've lost through through all of the different shows they've done on Disney Plus. I and like I said, it was the fact that like the ending of this movie just feels so out of nowhere and out of left field. Where again, like they were clearly setting this up to be a handoff to Phoebe Waller Bridge, and then it's like halfway through they just decided no. And then like when 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 it came to Bob Iger, he was like, yeah, this is like Harrison Ford is saying this is definitively his last time. Uh, being Indiana Jones, I, I think the thing that he said was that, like, yeah, he felt better leaving this in a play. He felt better off leaving off here than he did at the end of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. To which I gotta say, I, I, I scratch my head because if you look at just the exact ending shot of this movie as opposed to the ending of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Yeah. It's almost the exact same shot and same sequence. So, like, do you, do you want to talk about this ending now? Because I've, I've been thinking about this since yesterday, since I saw the movie, and I still cannot make heads or tails of it. Should, I, should we I start really... at the very ending or, like, the third act? No, 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 the, the whole third act sequence. So, the, the okay. whole third act yeah. sequence is they get the dial, right? Indy's been shot. Like, like shot. Like, like not, like, 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 grazed through the arm. Like, shot, like... Right here. Like, it's not, like, fatal, but, like, he can't exactly, like, make a whole lot of, uh, of movement with it, right? And the Nazis, you know, after having assembled the dial, they're like, okay, we have to get in a plane, and then the dial... I will say, my, 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 I was watching with my dad, and he said, like, hey, someone fixed the bridge. Because <laughs> <laughs> they break the bridge, and then they walk back across it. And it's that's right! Fine. Oh, my God, that's right! Oh, man, I didn't even notice that. That's actually really funny. Um, So so they get on a plane, pursued, of course, by people on the bridge in the short round stand in, and they go through the, a fissure in time. And, of course, halfway through, Harrison Ford, who is now magically fine again, he's like, you know, he's like, he's getting up, he's cracking jokes. He's like, you didn't account for continental drift. You're not, I don't know where you were going, but it's not 1945. And they travel back in time. To the Battle of, of Syracuse, which, which oh, that, that just killed me in the beginning when they were like, oh, not Syracuse, New York, Syracuse in Sicily. And I'm like, oh, God. Um, and to, 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 the, to, the Roman, uh, 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 to the Roman attack of Sicily with, with, with Archimedes. And so, they, and so it leads to them crash landing. The Nazis die and they, and they meet up with, uh, and they meet up with, um, also, so they meet up with Archimedes in the past. And then Indiana Jones is like, oh, I'm going to stay. You know, there's nothing for me in the present. You know, I'm going to stay and I'm going to die peacefully here. And Phoebe Waller-Bridge is all of a sudden like, no, you can't. You'll screw up history. All that. And it leads. And finally, the way for her to get him back to the present is her punching him in the face, cut to black, and then he wakes up in his apartment. Also, the fact that, like, right before she punched him, he was, like, sitting on the ground just, like, you know, like, well, so, like, content with dying when he was, like, seemingly fine two minutes ago. Like, like this movie really had, like, a, a loose grasp on, um, on, 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 on logic and physics and stuff of, like, you know, how people get punctured. By, like, you have Phoebe Waller Bridge in Morocco earlier in this movie smashing out a glass, the, 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 the glass rear, uh, mirror, rear, uh, what's it called? Um, what's it called? Uh, the, the the glass on the back of a car, 
and crawling through it without even so much as a scratch. And I'm like, I know that that's always been in that that's always been a thing in movies recently, but here it just felt particularly egregious, especially the fact that like she's not exactly suited for action sequences. And so just watching her like pull off these ridiculous action sequences was kind of hilarious to watch. And so she Mission Impossible climbs on the plane as well. Yeah, so she made she, like... she Mission Impossible climbed on the plane as well. So so she does that. Well, well, you know, in fairness, they can't have Harrison Ford doing that stuff anymore. Yeah, and and they don't have someone as, as physically fit as Tom Cruise. So that so they had to have somebody doing it. She was probably like their 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 best their next best chance. And I swear to God, so he wakes up in the apartment, and then Marion walks in. With Sala and his kids. That's right. Sala's also back in this movie for like five seconds. And Sala's like, I could go with you. And India's like, nah. And then he walks into the airport. And and and, 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 and Sala's making the, go get them, Indiana Jones. And then as Indy turns around, he almost gets hit by a car. And I'm like, okay, I don't know if this is supposed to be your joke or not. But it, it, this feels like a fuck you. And, and, and Marion walks in. And then they do the take. On the uh, from the first one, where it's like, oh, where does it hurt? Here, you know, and you have Indy doing it to Marion now, and you can clearly see that it's she's like, oh, are you back? Are you really back? And it's like, oh, ha ha, I get it, you know, because he hasn't been himself since their son died. And they all leave the apartment, and you see them like walking, and then it pans up to the hat hanging outside the apartment, and then he just reaches outside, grabs the hat, and brings it in, and then it ends. I'm like, what is this ending? I'm like, I'm so confused. I I don't understand what this is supposed to mean. Like, is this supposed to be like? The final like thing on on it because you had that at the end of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull where he drops the hat. You have Shia LaBeouf going to pick it up and then he grabs it and is like, nope, and I'm like being like, yep, there. It, it's a fun ending. ending. It's quite funny. It's 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 wholesome. It, it's right. it puts it's a, it's a nice end end. And I guess they wanted to rep- replicate that because you just, they just can't come up with anything better than that. Um, right. I, I to be fair, I didn't mind the the Marion appearance. I thought it was well. The Marion nice appearance was good because I, I wasn't it expecting it, uh, so I thought that was good. And also, I just keep getting deterred by the fact that you know it's been 15 years since the last one. And I thought that Karen, the the, the that, that Karen Allen aging between Raiders of the Lost Ark and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was already jarring it up. And then seeing her now, I'm like, oh my god! I'm like, they they just they keep bringing her back, and she keeps getting older, you know. And I, I know that's what happens, but. Yeah, I, you're, I I couldn't agree with you more. And I think what's most jarring about it is not the fact that they're trying to just replicate the ending of Kiss, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It's the fact that trajectory-wise, going based off of what the movie has been setting up through this point, they are clearly intending for Indiana Jones to stay in the past and die. Like, that's, that's the end goal of the movie. But it's almost like they chickened out and got cold feet at the last minute where it's like, okay, I wouldn't have liked it either way. Like, you're kind of screwed either way. But at the very least, that would have made more sense if he had stayed in the past and just, like, died there, you know? And then you have, like, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, like, going and finding his tomb, you know? Like, like I'm not saying that would have been that much better, but, like, just based off of what the movie was setting up, it would have made more sense. And then you have this, like, half ass out of nowhere faux sentimental ending where it's like you don't even have anyone to pass the torch to. It's just over. And I'm just leaving the theater and I'm like, I just feel depressed and let down. Like, I'm like, I'm, what is this supposed to mean ultimately? Because he's too old to go on any more adventures. Okay, he's back with Marion, but he already was back with Marion. In fact, you just invented this whole new But he's back with Marion again, though. Again, he's like, for what, 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 what is it you said? Like, the cheer, first cheer time, audience. Right? You have to cheer. clap. Exactly. It, it felt so manufactured. So, you brought up the point before uh, at the beginning of this where you're like, this is the this is just another attempt at a third movie. So like maybe 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 go into a little bit more of what you mean by that. Well, I guess because Last Crusade, it was like they literally rode off into the sunset. I don't know. Did that movie create that saying? Probably not, but it it's just so perfect. And then Crystal Skull, it was it was a nice uh, tie back to the first one. You know, Marion's back. They get, they finally get married. They're happy. They have they have their son who who's like, oh, maybe I'll be Indiana Jones. Like, oh, no, yeah, uh, that, that was funny. And this one, yeah, they just don't do much with it. They thought like Crystal Skull that was gonna be final one, and now this is the final one. They just yeah, yeah, just more studio meddling, more just making movies in this franchise for cash grabs. Uh, like like I said, the, the first movie it is it is very seamless. It is it is almost entirely it is extremely extremely rare when you have a franchise from the seventies eighties that has a perfect ending, and then they make more movies after that. Like I said, I think the only real exception to that are the Star Wars prequels because those take place in a different time period in the universe, and they are telling their own story that ultimately leads into the trilogy that we saw. So they kind of complement each other, but every single time they tried to make more sequels after the original ended, you know. Going back to Terminator, every, there's a reason why every single movie after Terminator 2 has been awful. It's because it was supposed to end 
with Terminator 2 and Cameron. You know, you, you, could, you could pick any other franchise from that time period. And Indiana Jones, I think, has been the most egregious. And again, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, it wasn't amazing, but, it, you know, it was still good, you know, because the idea is it's like, yeah, Indiana Jones is always going to go on more adventures, but it was the fact that, and, and, and the movies always have, like, had a standalone presence to them, but there was something just so fitting and so final to, um, to Last Crusade that when you get Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, uh, at the very least, that's the, it's like a little bookend, a nice little epilogue, you know, where it's like, again, he's lost his dad, they he lost Marcus, but at the very least, you know, he has Marion and he has his son. But now with this movie, it's like, okay, he has Marion again, but with, it, it still feels hollow. He was 10 minutes away from just staying in the past and like literally allowing himself to become a relic. Like that's, I don't know. It, it, it's just like, I tend not to get into the whole, oh, you know, we don't want this for our heroes. You know, all these studios are just shitting all over our, and destroying our heroes from the past. I tend not to get into that because I'm always more so like what's better for the story. But when the story here just isn't that compelling to begin with, I'm like, I, I my, my brain kind of does go there, you know, because Disney has shown ultimately now time and time again, really since COVID, but even before COVID, that they've just lost their ability to tell good stories. They really have. So that being said, this is not my least favorite movie of the year. I liked, uh, I, I disliked Shazam and Quantumania more, but I, I can't say that this is one of my favorites of the year. I can't say that I really particularly enjoyed this. Like I said, this is the first, and, and, and coming off of, um, of summer, uh, of, of a summer movie season, like I said, that's the whole point of the summer series is we've been talking about having just like a series of fun big budget movies, you know, for the first time since 2019, you know, where even though we haven't, not every single movie that we've had has been fantastic for the most part, you know, we've enjoyed every single one of them. You know, I liked Guardians 3, uh, Guardians 3 and Across the Spider-Universe are two of the best movies we've had so far this year. I enjoy anything Transformers related. Uh, Fast and Furious was dumb fun, even if they, those movies are getting objectively worse and worse. And I still think that people were too harsh on The Flash. I mean, that movie's not great, but I still think that the reputation of DC and Ezra Miller can't destroy, not to mention the fact that like all the other DC movies that were coming out this year, um, the what's it called, kind of destroyed any chance this movie had of being well-received. And I think that all things considered, the movie wasn't the worst, you know? And then last weekend was just like a fun weekend with, you know, a new Wes Anderson movie and a new Jennifer Lawrence comedy and all that. And, you know, some pretty good indie movies as well this summer. And this is really the first summer movie and hopefully only one that has just been overall really largely disappointing. Like, I can't, like... The, you, there's no fun really to be had with this movie, even with the stunts. The side characters are obnoxious. The the the, the plot mechanics are tedious and repetitive. And in terms of it feeling like an Indiana Jones movie, it just doesn't feel that compelling because just co just a comparison to the characterization and the awesomeness that comes with the other ones, it just it doesn't have that. So I can't. I, I this is the first summer movie that I can't really recommend for people. Yeah, there's going to be a bunch of people that go to see it because of the IP recognition and all that. But overall, not a fan. Ultimately, I don't know. What 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 are your thoughts? What are your final thoughts? And, um, I, I saw two new movies this week. One, one of them was it was funny. It was kind of sweet. It was uh, a reminder of how, how of the movies of old, how they used to be. Uh, it was a fun summer romp. The, the lead characters had really great chemistry. And I, I left the theater feeling hmm, that was that was quite great. I would recommend that to someone. Yeah. And uh, Indiana Jones was not that movie. Definitely not. <laughs> it, it, Definitely was no not. Hard feelings. Uh, indeed, no hard feelings. I really enjoyed no hard feelings. Yeah, I, I saw your post on it, Instagram. Yeah, it, I, it, I enjoyed it. You know, Dustin and I reviewed, talked about that a little bit last week. You know, he didn't like it as much as I did. I didn't think it was the best movie of the year, but it was fun. You know, it was just a fun, nice, sweet uh, movie throwback to movies of old. Sure, it wasn't as, like, laugh out loud funny. But again, I attribute that to the I attribute that to the marketing and the fact that the movie marketed it's that, that they marketed it as a raunchy comedy. It was more of like a sweet coming of age movie, you know. And Indiana Jones, unfortunately, was not that movie. Um, I guess the the full disappointment hasn't quite set in. I I, I enjoyed a, a, a fair amount of it. It's still Indiana Jones. The, the IP brand is is quite a bit for me still. Uh, upon rewatch, it might go down. Uh, so right now is it? It's a three stars. Uh. But yeah, I, I, I can't say I'm I'm totally surprised by this, like especially after the the cans uh, reactions, like the, yeah. the the big green stain on the Rotten Tomatoes, like Ooh. yeah, yeah. The worst fears have been realized. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, indeed. It's I, I mean, them opening that that this movie at can was already a risk to begin with. But yeah, you know, you know what it is for me. I, so I, I purposely had not given a this movie a star rating yet. I was doing that thing when I got out of the theater where I'm like. 
Ah, uh, that is it's, it's a well enough made movie. And I and notice that we haven't mentioned James Mangold as a director at all. It really sucks because James Mangold was a guy who established himself as a pretty awesome independent director, not as well known, making movies like Girl Interrupted and, and Copland in the late 90s, and then had some interesting movies in the early 2000s with movies like Identity and uh and and Walk the Line. And then and, and for me, making one of the best Western remakes of all time with three that 310 to Yuma movie that he did with with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale is probably my one of my favorites of the revisionist Western period that we got exclusively in the year 2007. And ever since he made Night and Day with Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz, and he great. started getting and he started getting noticed by the studios. You know, we've obviously talked about his relationship with Fox, with the Wolver, with the solo Wolverine movies, how. The Wolverine was good, but not as well fully realized. Then obviously he makes Logan, which is arguably his magnum opus. You're a big fan of Ford versus Ferrari, but I gotta say it feels like Mangold has kind of been like replace has kind of been like adopted to replace John Favreau as like kind of the heir apparent as far as like okay he's their go to guy when they need a guy that can make a good movie but won't have too much of a risky artistic vision that will like deviate, you know, because they, they are, they are so scared of having another Edgar Wright situation on their hands, you know, or, or another James Gunn after, after, after what happened there, you know, they, they do not want directors that are going to have a unique artistic vision. They want a director. That's going to be a good company, man. That's going to show up, do what he's told, make a competent movie. And it sucks. Cause I've always thought that Mangold was like a pretty decent director. His indie movies are fantastic. And, I got to say, like, he's doing a Bob Dylan movie with Timothy Chalamet next. He's doing Swamp Thing for DC and supposedly is directing another Star Wars movie. And I can't say I'm really looking forward to any of those movies, unfortunately, for all the different reasons associated with them. I mean, Swamp Thing might be good, but be, uh, uh, under Gunn's direction at DC. But, yeah, it, it's just it's disappointing. And I was walking out of the theater being like, Mangold's a good director. You know, the movie itself, like, it wasn't a poorly made movie. Like, he knows how to make a movie. I'm like, there was just, there was nothing. It just, it felt hollow. Like, I, this is the first movie that I've seen since, like, at the very least with Quantumania, I came out being like, okay, that movie was bad, but it was weird and wild and crazy. And Shazam, I watched that movie at home, and and, and me and, and me and this, my friend who were watching it, we were just laughing and making fun of it the whole time because of how stupid it was. So at the very least, we were able to get some fun out of that, out of those two, you know? But this one, I'm like, this is the first movie that I've seen all year that just had me depressed walking out of it. And, and I should never be depressed walking out of an Indiana Jones movie, you know? I should, oh, my whole thing is like, I always want to walk out of an Indiana Jones movie feeling like I had the best time ever. I will always have such fond memories of watching the, those movies. You know, it was while I was in middle school. My parents were finally starting to let us, like, watch some cooler, riskier movies. We finally started watching the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. The, my parents showed us the first two, the, the first couple of Indiana Jones, all three original Indiana Jones movies. And we just had a fucking blast watching those movies. They were so much fun. They were so funny. They were so full of wit and wonder. They had some crazy visuals. And this just had none of that. It just had absolutely none of that. So for me... I'm giving it, I think this is like my lowest rated movie of the year. I'm only giving this like a one and a half star, and that's only for like some fun set piece, action set pieces. So that's really it, you know? I, I, I'm glad that you're going to put in the work to watch this movie. I don't ever want to watch this movie ever again. And this is probably the first Lucasfilm movie since Rise of Skywalker that I'm like, yeah, I never want to watch this movie ever again. So... Yeah, that's really it. Hopefully, our only disappointing installment in our in our summer series. Like I said, Dustin and I are coming back next week to review Joyride and also do the next Actors Hall of Fame, which is going to be the lead up to Mission Impossible. We're going to do our Tom Cruise Hall of Fame, and then the week after, Luke, it's two straight weeks of just glorious. As you're on for Mission Impossible, and you're on for the Oppenheimer Barbie double dealing. July is finally here, people. Oh, it's going to be a good one. Luke, thank you once again for joining me. Where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? Other good people can follow me at Luke Reviews on Instagram and YouTube. If you want to see an Indiana Jones video, why I think Indiana Jones works so well, you know, at least the four, first four movies, uh, you can you can check that video out. Uh, uh, but yeah, otherwise, see me on here in a couple of weeks. I'm steaming through the Oppenheimer book that the movie is uh, somewhat based on. It's it's very good. Uh, Nolan has a lot to lot to deliver to us, but I have every trust that he will be able to do so in the very interesting and engaging way and i'm ready to be absolutely i don't know what the word is people say this they're speechless after seeing oppenheimer so yes i i, I can't wait this has been my number one most anticipated movie of the year since uh what's it called um what's it called for, for really just since the movie's announcement and like i said that as the movie has been ticking closer 
if you will. Uh, what's it called? You you can follow me at Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms. Be sure to follow the official Talking TV podcast across all platforms. Subscribe to us if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, what's it called? Go follow us on Twitch as well. This episode will be available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts uh, on Monday. Uh, happy 4th of July, people. Uh, I will be on vacation uh, in a couple of hours. And as always, people, 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time.